The rose that grew from concrete. Did you hear about the rose that grew from a crack in the concrete? Proving nature's law is wrong, it learned to walk without having feet. Funny it seems, but by keeping its dreams, it learned to breathe fresh air. Long live the rose that grew from concrete when no one else ever cared. Tupac Shakur. Poetry and pollution, global fiction and global warming. I know the different spheres of my talk aren't normally associated with each other, but here's how they connect. For centuries, African Americans were considered to be animal rather than human fit to be bought and sold, branded and bred. Our writers responded by crafting a literary canon that defended our humanity, but they also expressed empathy with the exploited natural realm. And now that our world is in the midst of ecological disaster, now that climate change is harming our ecosystems and threatening the global food supply, the stories and poems black artists created are more important than ever because they contain essential insights into how to save our planet. Now, I understand if black literature, or even black people, aren't the first resources you think of when it comes to protecting the environment. Even environmental activist Van Jones, who is African American, says, in my neighborhood, you go around talking to people about polar bears, they are not feeling you. <laughs> Van Jones is from Oakland, California. And the neighborhood about which he speaks is, like many places, poor, urban, and black. His claim makes sense, doesn't it? This is a nation that can't even build a consensus that black lives matter, so polar bears are probably pretty far down on the priority list in Oakland, Ferguson, or the Bronx, right? I disagree. After all, it was the African-American poet Lucille Clifton who wrote, being property once myself, I have a feeling for it. That's why I can talk about environment. I argue much of African-American literature suggests if you're on a journey to a healthier planet, black people are essential to your project. If your aim is to save the trees, heed those who are once their strange fruit. If you hope to speak for the voiceless, listen to those who were once bound into bits and bridles. Listen to African-American literature. Like polar bears, African Americans have been the first to suffer harms, harms that have all too often been neglected. We scream, we can't breathe because of a noose, because of air pollution, because of a policeman's arm around our necks, but it takes so long for the law to hear us. The thing is, though, that experience of oppression uniquely positions us to empathize with and advocate for the environment. Not only do black people care about polar bears, but polar bears don't stand a chance without us in our stories. Let me give you an example. Tupac Shakur was a hip hop artist and poet from Oakland. He represented the West Coast during the East Coast West Coast hip hop rivalry of the 1990s. 20 years later, urban minority communities are still battling on the West Coast. They're not fighting for musical dominance, but for environmental justice. Shakur's poem points to grim sociological realities, but it indexes ecological ones too. Like the long odds of youths developing healthily in places where the only green is what manages to grow up through the concrete. You see, green places like parks and gardens don't just provide habitats for trees, rabbits, and bees. Their presences increase health benefits and lower rates of violence. Green places begin protecting children before they're even born. When impoverished mothers have access to green space, their babies are born with healthier, higher birth weights. But in California, there's extremely unequal access to green space. In one area of Black Los Angeles, there's only one playground for every 23,000 children. In LA's white neighborhoods, there are 32 acres of park for every 1,000 people. In the black neighborhoods, there's only 1.7 acres like the size of a large backyard. This poem makes it clear, in too many communities, if your skin is black, green you lack. For the rose in the poem, clean air is a dream, just as it is for many African American kids. They're much more likely than their white buddies to live in polluted areas with high ozone levels. 
That's why our children die of asthma at seven times the rate of their white peers. Only one in every 10 white children suffers from asthma. For black kids, it's more like one in five. Black kids live with and die from asthma at higher rates than whites. But for kids like those in Oakland, the situation's even worse because there's a class component too. The biggest risk factors for asthma are simply being black or Puerto Rican and poor. These verses sound the alarm. It is a struggle simply to breathe while black. Long live the rose that grew from concrete when no one else ever cared. The poem's last lines speak of an indifference all too familiar to the marginalized. They grieve the fact society often seems not to care that people of color and the poor bear more than their share of environmental burdens, but receive less than their share of environmental benefits. Our plight inspires our literature, but it doesn't seem to be inspiring policy. Now, it's not as though there aren't laws on the books in Shakur's state aimed at protecting both nature and vulnerable human populations. But those laws are piecemeal. They're these single issue bills that treat things like toxic waste cleanup and reduction in diesel emissions. They leave brutal gaps in the ecological protections they hope to offer because they center on environmental sins rather than on victimized populations. Shakur's poem may reference a rose that proves nature's law wrong, but it also illuminates what laws dealing with nature get wrong. In contrast to California's legislation, Shakur's poem takes an integrated look at the oppression that keeps both plants and people from thriving. It references lack of green space, lack of fresh air, and environmental injustice, all in eight lines. But what if California allowed African-American literature to inform the way it does law? Well, it might do something radical. It might make environmental laws that are actually civil rights laws. You see, Shakur's poem reminds us of what current environmental laws just don't understand, that oppressed people don't experience injustice in separate parts, but as a coherent whole, something the Civil Rights Act of 1964 also recognizes. The act outlaws segregation and discrimination in a broad array of arenas. By placing racial minorities rather than individual racial injustices at the center of the act, it bans several different forms of inequity at once, offering blanket protection. We need to make environmental laws like that. We need to craft policies that are community rather than issue focused and compound several matters. I'm talking about laws that outline humans' green civil rights. Funny, it seems, making environmental laws that are actually people-centered. But much of African-American literature reminds us that human nature divisions are false. Because blacks exist in a shared and fragile ecology with nature, what's good for blacks is good for the environment. A world in which African-Americans thrive is one that will foster roses. It's simple. Protect the environmental rights of marginalized people and you protect the environment itself. To make the best green policy, consult black prose and poetry. Slave narratives will be the cooling force that saves polar bears. Hip hop will be the filter that cleans our air. African American literature will water the rose that grew from concrete. Because green, green is just the new black.